the dark cosmos stay cosmic. Ines, what do you reckon this message means? I'm stumped, Liam. They say they're Proxima B people, but I don't understand how that's even possible. Can it be a looped message, picked up by one of the stations in the region? I'm not an expert on that, but looping for two centuries? I doubt it. Also, this language they're using doesn't sound quite right. Yeah, that's why Captain asked for you specifically. No one else here can translate Proxima talk. I mean, it does sound similar to how the colonists in the region speak, but it's like the language has deteriorated into something more primitive. I had trouble understanding the message fully myself. While myself and Innes discussed over comms the strange message that our freighter ship Pax Humana had received from Proxima B, the captain had ordered engineering to take us into the Alpha Centauri system on a direct course toward the planet. Not even freighter ships moving product were allowed to dismiss distress calls after the Great Wars, no matter how urgent the colonies needed what they were hauling. Alpha Centauri had been generally off-limits for a while since the crux of the Third War had been between two life-bearing planets there. Proxima B got the worse end of the stick in that one, which was the reason why we were so wary of the message we had received from the planet. As far as we knew, no one there had been left alive, and the habitable zone of the planet was left completely ravaged, either from the intense weaponry used during the battles, or the second wave of eradication that Proxima C led there. What had been the end of one planet was the beginning of peace for many others. We were only alive because of the blood spilled on Proxima B. On that note, I must admit I was grateful for their sacrifice. Otherwise... Moira to Liam. Captain informed me that I was requested to join the away mission. You were. I need someone that's quick on their feet, and your military training might come in handy on the surface. Great. I'm up for a little shore leave. Don't get ahead of yourself. We have no idea what's down there. Dirt, rain, wind, that's all I need. If you like acid rain. I could hear Moira sigh over comms. She wasn't the only one that needed some shore leave. We had been on a particularly long haul, and the detour inside Alpha Centauri made it even longer. But I wasn't as excited to touch down on the planet as Moira was and not just because of the state in which I expected we would find the planet. Something about that message sounded eerie and unsettling that made me think it wasn't going to be an easy mission. Innes shared my concerns, so I was thankful that she would be on the ground with me too. The captain had even voiced a very real concern that the distress call might be an ambush. Considering Proxima C didn't much like old humans like us Terrans, and there had been talks that they were preparing something big again. Those fears never ended after the wars. However, they also never amounted to anything. Placing all precautions in action regardless, the captain made it clear that navigating through the system should be as inconspicuous as possible. There were to be less long-range communications, we would creep through asteroid fields when we could, and we were to keep our eyes peeled for Proxima C Challenger ships. If there was anyone still alive on Proxima B that needed our help, they would have to find a way to survive until we got there. No communication was sent in return to the distress call, for we didn't want to alert their neighbors of their possible existence or our own crawl through their system. Our captain was adamant that I could only take two of our own to reach the surface. Only as many as one shuttle can carry. He would repeat this in a deep baritone after I would express my concerns over the rescue mission. 
That was also the last thing he said to me when Pax Humana finally established a steady orbit around the planet. I knew that he wasn't willing to lose more than three if the distress call ended up being an ambush. If you ask me, the ship was more of a sitting duck in orbit than on the brutal grounds of what we expected to be a desolate planet. Much to our surprise, the planet turned out to be not so desolate after all. Once our deep scans were finished, they showed lush vegetation and an endless array of life forms thriving on the surface in what was called the lifeline by the first colonists. No one could make heads or tails out of it. Not a single person on board had enough understanding in exobiology or in the history of the wars for that matter to be able to understand what was going on down there. We had seen planets recuperating fast after catastrophic events. We'd seen worlds heal themselves at astounding levels for relatively short amounts of time. We'd even stolen from those worlds and were hauling some of their treasures on board the Pax Humana to bring to another colony but we weren't prepared for what we saw on the surface of Proxima B. The lifeline looked like a paradise from where we were standing. The lean habitable zone circling the planet, tidally locked to its M-type star, appeared as if it were drawn on the surface, impossible to exist. I'd heard stories from my father that peering down at Proxima B left that kind of impression on Terrans. He, in turn, had heard that from his grandfather, who fought in the last of the wars. Moira was very happy when we made the discovery and reminded me of our first conversation about the mission every chance she got. I was even more reserved at that point about going down on the planet than I was while we were traversing through the treacherous spaces of the Alpha Centauri. The captain decided that we should send a response to the distress call at last and wait a day or so for a reply before my little away team could venture down. We waited. There was no response. Our scans caught a curious amount of organisms grouping near the vicinity of one of the abandoned colony cities, and there were traces there of what can only be described as proto-industry. Can it be? Innes asked me during our briefing. Not possible. We can't be sure of that, Moira. It might be Proxima C have finally decided to take this planet too. It was their intention. I agree with Liam. Maybe that's why their language sounds so strange to me. There hasn't been any communication with Proxima C for at least a century after the Sapien Accords. It could have easily morphed into something else without any kind of interaction with the other colonies of the region. Spare me the sociolinguistics lecture, Innes. Are we going down there or what? What she has to say is important, Moira. It's the only clue we have for now. So, bring big guns? Innes wasn't amused by Moira's nonchalant suggestion of the violence that might erupt. Unlike her, I wanted some nasty firepower on our end. Too bad only Moira knew how any of those weapons worked. If anything would go down, she'd be the only one left standing. Two days had passed since we sent our response to the surface of Proxima B. When the three of us were shoved into one of the oldest shuttles that the captain didn't mind losing, Priest had blessed the vessel and gave us all coin for payment if we should reach the netherworld before returning to Pax Humana. I asked for an individual prayer to keep and Priest whispered into my ear before I closed the shuttle hatch. The descent was harsh and turbulent. Moira could barely keep her food down and Innes passed out after a minute or so upon hitting the atmosphere. I wasn't the best pilot, I'll gladly admit, but their reaction to the journey just reminded me how tough it would be for us to find our legs once we would touch ground. Blessed ancestors, blessed sons and daughters, may the human seed remain forever sacred and ongoing. May we always remain intact 
animals only in name, and so in battle. Shit. Repeating my little prayer in my mind didn't help in easing my fears. I clutched my coin in my left hand so Moira wouldn't see me between bouts of retching and vomiting. Upon arrival, it took us two more days to leave the shuttle. We needed more, many more. Out of our tiny starboard porthole, we could see what the lifeline of Proxima B had to offer. There were grand trees, or what seemed like trees to me, and other amazing plant life that I had even fewer tools in my vocabulary to describe since I'd never seen this much vegetation on Earth either. Which one was the dead planet, I thought. There were no animals though, none that we could see anyways. And we were a bit further away from the city to have alerted whatever possible surviving humans were out there to our descent into the line. The additional scans that we made once we touched down uncovered traces of radiation that would be difficult for anyone to survive. Any one human to survive. Which in turn meant that we had to take the long trek to the city in our suits. Once inside, the mere construction of the city should be enough to protect us if there was enough of it that was still standing. At this point, the three of us had little hope of actually finding any remaining colonists and attributed the initial reading of the surface as a mistake or even wishful thinking. I don't know what scared me more, having made the long detour here for nothing and getting further away from my son, or being ambushed by the Proxima Sea monsters that had stopped being human long ago. The lifeline was hotter than hell. We landed on the very edge that was bordering the side of the planet, constantly facing Proxima Centauri, forever torched by its flames. The suits were unbearable to be in, but we had to keep them on. We were blasted with enough radiation on the Pax Humana getting here already, and it would take a long time before we'd reach the next medical colony to recuperate. Liam! What is it, Moira? I noticed that she was getting a bit on edge for the last few kilometers of our hike through the alien jungle, but I had attributed it to exhaustion and overheating. There's something following us. We all stopped. Innes nervously looked around and crouched down, hiding in the tall grass. I could see nothing except for the long trail of a high forest in the perpetual dusk. Even with our visors, all the colors were still weird and it was difficult to discern what was what. Not that we could recognize anything here if we wanted to. There! Moira pointed to our left and raised her rifle in that direction, looking through the scope. I still saw nothing. There was a bit of wind and some of the plant life was swaying. You're overreacting. It's just the wind. No one can stand the radiation. I see it too. Innes was still crouching, but her attention was zeroed in on the single point in the distance to our left. What the fuck is that, Moira? Can you see? Barely. I have to remove my visor. Don't do it, Moira! She looked at me. Even though I couldn't see her face, I felt her disdain. Considering only her training for our mission, I had forgotten that her courage turned into stupidity fast. Of course, she took off her fucking visor. She really was looking at me with disdain. Moira peeked through her scope again. It was only seconds before she said anything, but it felt like an eternity. I don't know what I was expecting her to see. Holy shit! What? It's a human! I ran to her. Unbelieving and just as stupid, I took off my visor too so I could see there was nothing there. What the? Moira pressed my eye on the scope again and pushed the rifle more to the left. Then I saw him. A human. Was he human? He didn't look Proxima C, but he didn't look completely like us either. Innes had stood up and had taken off her visor too. She must have realized what we were seeing. So she began talking to him. 
shouting bizarre Proxima speak in the dusky distance. A few moments passed in silence, waiting for a response, with only the winds whooshing through the jungle scape. Blessed ancestors, blessed sons and daughters. He shouted back. Innes was the only one that understood any of it and tried her best to communicate with the colonist in a shouting match that ran for ages back and forth. I was still looking through the scope and noticed a few more humanoid heads popping out of the bushy area where the first one had stood. Gods, there's more, I whispered to Moira. Maybe you should give me the rifle, chief? Don't shoot them up, not if they behave. I kept close to Moira. I didn't know what could set her off, and I wanted to be there to stop it. On the other hand, I felt much safer next to her if there ended up being a reason to open fire on our planetary hosts. Follow! Innes yelled at us from across the small clearing where we were standing. They said we should follow them! She started walking toward the humanoids, which Moira had counted were around 11 at that point. Should we? That's why we're here, I answered, and we both stared after Innes. Moira kept her weapon steady. She wasn't prepared to die on this strip of paradise somewhere in the Alpha Centauri system. They took us deeper into the jungle. I had lost any sense of direction and time. Innes was speaking to one of the older ones from the group as they were walking side by side up front. Moira and I were surrounded by the little ones that behaved like children, very curious about us, but also very leery of us. Hey, don't touch that! I turned around and found Moira pointing her rifle at one of the tiny humanoids. Put the weapon down! Innes echoed. Do what she says, Moira! I said, taking a step toward her and placing my hand on her tensed shoulder. It was going for my knife, Moira spoke through her teeth. She's curious, that's all. Calm down. Put it down, Moira. You're making Daddy here very nervous. Come on, listen to Innes. We don't know what they're like. We don't want trouble. Liam, we still don't know what they are. Moira glanced at me. So let's find out. I moved my hand over the weapon and slowly pushed it toward the ground. The older humanoid that was leading the group began shouting. I barely managed to subdue Moira to not shoot him. Innes was saying something to him and the little one stood frozen in front of us. She had peed herself. Before I could do anything, the little one was gone. She had fled somewhere in the dense jungle surrounding us. Blessed ancestors, blessed sons and daughters, may the human seed remain forever sacred and ongoing. After everything had calmed, we finally reached what had remained of the first city established on Proxima B. We were given beds to rest, and we were promised to meet the chieftain that took care of the strange colonists who had once been human. The three of us pretended to sleep while the remaining nine children looked over us. What did he tell you? I had to ask Innes when the children fell asleep surrounding us. I doubt if I understood even a third of what he said. Basic things are easy, but the rest is a massive blur. I think they actually are Proxima B colonists. How, how have they survived? Moira whispered from the next bed close to mine. I couldn't say, and I don't know if they even understand. I think they don't remember that there was a war here. However, they do seem to remember Proxima C troops coming down in the line. Honestly, I'm glad I didn't understand that part well. It isn't something I want in my head. Why did they send for help? Did he say? I tried to remain on point. Their chieftain finally got one of the transmitters to work. How he did that, I couldn't tell you. I can guess that whatever industry they have is run on old generators from the factories that used to be here. But why, Innes? Moira sneered at her. He didn't say. 
Their chieftain wants to do it. Some kind of welcome ceremony. Maybe I misunderstood. I'm not sure. All right. My fears were slightly calmed. It's not that there weren't any dangers left being surrounded by people that weren't in contact with others for two centuries, but at least I knew that we didn't walk into a Proxima Sea ambush. I fell asleep fast and had vivid dreams about the planet. Moira was there, and so was Innes. We were being led to the chieftain by the little girl that had vanished in the jungle. The chieftain had two heads and was propped on a pedestal made out of creatures that barely resembled humans, intertwined into one another like they were growing out of each other. I woke up, hyperventilating. The girl was seated next to Moira's bed and was watching her sleep. I dismissed her and she scampered away in an instant like a cat. The rest of the children were gone too. I passed out again. Blessed ancestors, blessed sons and daughters, may the human seed remain forever sacred and ongoing. May we always remain intact. Innes woke me up in what I can only guess was the next day, because the light had remained the same. It's time, she said. As we walked toward what I'll refer to as the chieftain's palace, I felt like I had been there before. My gut churned and I was sweating buckets. I almost expected the chieftain to look like he did in my dream. We sat down in front of a throne made of bits and pieces of materials that were clearly meant to be something else. Everything went silent and the chieftain appeared in the distance of the hall. These people really had a flair for the dramatic. There was a light shining from behind him revealing only an imposing silhouette. As he approached, suddenly, one body turned into two, and the chieftain had split in half, standing on either side of the throne. One was male, the other female. Both are chieftain, Innes whispered to me and Moira. I think we should address them as such. As one, yes. Moira raised an eyebrow. You'll do the addressing. You be careful. Innes looked at me and I nodded. I couldn't help her much in communicating with them, even if I tried. Her hands were untied. She could be the ambassador in this weird little game with these humans that could have been aliens for all it mattered anymore. Just insist they tell you why they called for help, I said before she could address them. However, Innes never got the chance to speak. We were fed and entertained, and we were also giving lots of something that I could only imagine was wine. I felt lightheaded even after one glass, let alone the many others that followed. The three of us fell asleep again. Another day must have passed. When we woke up, I sent Moira back to the shuttle to radio the ship. At this point, I was convinced that what we interpreted as a message for help was actually an invitation to meet the long-lost colony of Proxima B. In a matter of a few days, the captain had sent most of the crew down to the planet for shore leave, while he and a few others remained back as a skeleton crew to take care of the ship. By the time the crew got here, it was already too late. I began noticing the bizarre apparitions after I sent Moira back to the shuttle. My dreams had become nightmares, and in them, all that at first had appeared human and humanoid was turning into a gruesome image of something else. Something both utterly alien, yet eerily familiar. When I would wake, I would see those creatures at the periphery of my vision always lurking from the shadows of their perpetual dusk. Moira and Innes had stopped speaking to each other first, then to me as well. We kept separate from each other, but were constantly surrounded by a barrage of barely humanoid-looking colonists. I thought Moira had looked changed when she came back from the shuttle, but I only fully realized how intense that change had been once I began noticing it happening to me as well. 
There were times when I thought that I was covered in scales, and times when I thought I could sense the ground vibrate as the others would pass by me. I had become as incommunicable to myself as those creatures that remained hidden enough as to remain indescribable. They had limbs in places that should not have limbs. Their eyes came sometimes in pairs of two and were sometimes five pairs clumped together on grotesque faces. I saw jaws that opened from ear to ear with jagged teeth that could crunch through the massive trees of the jungle. The changes had come even faster for the crew that dropped down in the lifeline, unprepared for whatever was influencing this change. Not one suit was even taken out of the shuttles. Not one precaution was taken. Whatever the distress call meant, at the end of the day, it was still an ambush. We were lured into the fake security of seeing something similar to humans, only to slowly unravel the mystery that was concealed simply by our inability to perceive it. This was all confirmed at the ceremony, welcoming the crew into the chieftain's palace. Moira was at the chieftain's feet, completely transfigured and almost unrecognizable as anything human. The little girl stood next to her with the knife she had stolen. The chieftain spoke, and I could almost understand their words now. They were declaring new blood entering their limited gene pool and inviting all the creatures of the shadows, their sons and daughters, to feast and procreate. We had brought a new potential for life to a savage planet. The girl raised the knife and pierced Moira's chest. Moira had become the sacrifice that consecrated the Proxima B ceremony. In my last human moments, while I still had my voice box intact by the changes ravaging my body and soul, I ran to the damned shuttle to contact Pax Humana. I wished that I hadn't adopted the Proxima B speech as my own so that the captain could understand me and send a message to my son that I hadn't abandoned him. The captain only heard me say, Blessed ancestors, blessed sons and daughters, may the human seed remain forever sacred and ongoing. May we always remain intact, animals only in name and so in battle. Hey sci-fi horror fans, it's John. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this story, make sure to smash that like button. A huge shout out to all our official members. We truly appreciate your support. Craving another scary tale? Click that video on your screen. Until next time, everyone. And remember, stay cosmic.